Hey folks, it's Tim, aka TurboBB. I've got another flashlight review for you today. Today I'm covering Olight's M18 Maverick. Now, for those of you old enough to remember, and of course I'm dating myself here, Maverick was the call sign of uh, Tom Cruise's character, Lieutenant Pete Mitchell, in the 1986 blockbuster movie, Top Gun. Now, it typically means, you know, one who doesn't like to follow orders, uh, which is quite apt for his characters because he's always had his own thoughts about dogfighting or whatnot. Now, as to how it pertains to the M series line of Olight, uh, because the M10 does use it as well, I don't know. But anyways, I digress. Getting into the packaging accessories, it did arrive in this uh, standard cardboard box with a uh, plastic display window. Came with the instructions covering the usage as well as the features and specs. And a little package that has a spare tail cap cover, two spare o-rings, a wrist strap, and a uh, anti-rattle battery carrier for use with um, CR123 cells. Now getting into the design and features, the M18 is basically the big brother of the M10 and the tactical version of the S20 baton. Now at the tip it does feature a um, nice fully deburred um, and nicely finished um, crenellated bezel. There is a uh, anti-reflective coating. Now that bezel is removable allowing access to that uh, ultra smooth reflector. Uh, there is also, as you can see, a red O-ring there. It does affect the tent ever so slightly, but only upon close distances. Uh, once the beam is cast out further, I don't notice it um, affecting the tent anymore. Now, the M18 does also utilize Cree's latest uh, XML2 LED, which is capable of about putting out about 500 lumens in this light. There are two switches. One is a master on-off uh, forward clicky switch, and there is also a electronic side switch. I'll get into that in the UI, but now covering off the rest of the light, uh, if you're familiar with Olight's products, uh, one glance would show that this is definitely an Olight product, right? This particular design motif has been around for a while now, and is also prominently featured on their uh, Top Dogs, like their SR series. So um, that is ad that adorns this light as well. It's not particularly aggressive, so I don't say it really contributes a lot in the way of uh, grip to the light, but then again, I don't feel it's really necessary because um, due to its size, you know, you could put apply a pretty good grip on it without requiring additional texturing. As previously mentioned, there is a forward clicky switch that allows one to engage a light with but half a press. And it also accesses um, strobe and high output easily, depending on how many times you press it. But again, I'll cover that in the UI. Now that switch is um, exposed so you could have easy access to it because again, the M18 was designed with tactical aspirations in mind, so. At the throat of the light, you see this um, deep carry uh, clip. Now, one really nice touch that I liked was the fact that there's an indent here, so if you're clipping it onto thinner material, it would catch over there. So that's uh, attention to details, folks. The tail cap is the only removable part of the light, meaning the head does not twist off. Uh, with it removed, you can see there are these very nice square cut threads, so it does give it a very, very nice um, smooth uh, action when you're threading on the tail cap. Now pairing into the tube, you will notice that there is a uh, spring on the head side, although it's probably a little hard to make out in the video, but trust me, it's there. And likewise, there's another spring here, so it acts as um, uh, anti-shock anti uh, for the batteries. Now size-wise, as you can see, it is a very compact light. So by way of comparison, this is the Xeno S3A on the left here. It's currently the most compact 18650 size light that I have in my collection. Um, to the right of the M18 is Olight's M20 Titanium Warrior. Now this was uh, personally picked out for me by uh, the kind folks at Battery Junction. Uh, I made this purchase quite a few years back and they were nice enough to actually hunt down one with a 7 in there. So uh, this is 177 out of 200. But this pretty much started off their M series line. Well, I should actually say that the non-titanium version did. Then later on, they had the limited edition titanium version, So, which I was uh, fortunate enough to pick up one. And then last but not least, you have Nikkor's P25, which ranks as one of the larger lights um, out there. So as you can see, again, overall fairly compact. Owing to its compact form, uh, I am able to get a very nice grip on it, either in an overhand grip or with an underhand grip. However though, one thing does need to be taken into consideration is this clip. If you're not using it, I guess you could remove it, but if you, it is in use, 
uh, only because of, if you're in the underhand grip and the activation of the side switch, this does kind of um, either dig into the fingers here or you know potentially block you. So uh, again, probably something you need to figure out with the placement because you, it can't really, while it does rotate fully around the light itself, uh, you wouldn't want to mount it to one of these round surfaces because they'll probably likely shift. Uh, that clip here would have to find one of these flat surfaces. So there's actually only three positions, which is this, the default, the left or the right, uh, in relation to the side switch. Now getting into the fit and finish of the light, I've now handled quite a, uh, a bunch of Olight's uh, products and I've yet to be disappointed in any of them. To me, Olight's products have always been uh, very precisely um, crafted and engineered. And as mentioned, you know, I just haven't had any serious issues with any of their lights. So starting at the tip here um, with the anodization, as you can see, it's a very nice uh, HA3 matte finish, uh, which I really like. Also, um, getting a close-up of the crevices here, you'll note that there are none missing whatsoever. Which is uh, the reason why I point that out is always those are typical issues that um, do crop up with poor anodizing processes. So that's why I've always mentioned that in my fit and finish section. Likewise, around the sharp edges here, um, I do not notice any missing whatsoever. It is all nicely and evenly applied. Also, the finish matches between the tail cap and the body. These are, again, common uh, issues that do crop up um, through the anodization process is if it's not carefully monitored or applied. All of the laser engraving is all very nice and sharp without any blotchiness whatsoever. And as you can see here, the tolerance is extremely tight so that after you thread down the bezel, it sits nice and flush. Of course, that does also depend on how hard you've tightened it because um, I did struggle a little bit with it, but if you'll recall in a video which I covered um, the reinstallation of the TN31's uh, bezel, just apply a little bit water because you know obviously water will eventually go away uh, because this surface mates directly with that rubber o-ring so the water will act as a lubricant and eventually when it dries out there will be none left so uh, that should help ease your installation if you're encountering troubles with it. Both the forward click and the side um, switch operate with very nice detents so the forward mechanical clicky switch as you can see, it has a very nice detent, and likewise, the electronic side switch has a very um, nice tactile feedback to it. While these may seem like minor things that I'm calling out, but in actual use, it, it does make a huge difference on you know how these switches feel feel like. So I'll give you an example, right? BMW, if I recall, I read somewhere that they actually have a dedicated program where engineers would go in and you know really test the tactile feedback of each switch just to ensure it provides the right amount of feedback, um, the sound it produces, the the texture of the buttons, all of that comes into play. Now, obviously, <laughs> this is not a BMW, and it's not a, a, meaning in the sense of a car that you sit in and you know have to uh, live with the feedback. But in terms of a light that you're considering for actual use, especially one that has um, tactical aspirations every little bit of these things uh, count. Now digging into the UI of the light, I would recommend that you take the time to familiarize yourself with it because at first initially it may seem a little tricky but once you nail it down it is very straightforward um, but especially in consideration if you're using it for a tactical purpose or law enforcement or whatnot uh, again I recommend that you familiarize yourself with it. So there is a master on off switch here with this switch off the side switch actually is inoperable so it doesn't matter how many times you press it or if you press and hold it it does nothing to the light this rear switch must be on in order for that side switch to function now so case in point the light will always go from low to medium to high and then the strobe is actually hidden so With the light on, if you press and hold on to the side switch, it will enter a fixed rate uh, 10 hertz strobe. And then you would simply click it again to exit out of it. But the, uh, there is also memory mode. So let's just say you last used it in low, which you can see here. Shut off the light. Turn it back on it will stay in low and that is actually memorized through battery changes as well. So case in point I'm just going to simply unscrew the tail cap here to lock out the light then turn it back on and you can see it's still engaging in low, medium, high. Now one thing though is that if you do engage strobe 
it will memorize that as well. So this is great. So if you have a need for instant access to Strobe, even if it's a momentary use, you can have that memorized. Now in this mode, you can also cycle between either high or the strobe. So let's just say initially you activate the strobe. Another half press will enter it into high. Now while in this mode, again this is the tactical use aspect of it, the light, this side switch is locked out. So you cannot accidentally uh, deactivate the high. You can leave it on in high with any worries about um, deactivating it. Now in the strobe mode, to deactivate it, you would simply press that side switch again. Although I have found that um, sometimes it's a little inconsistent. Sometimes it requires two depress, and sometimes it requires one. So uh, I haven't had a lot of time to play around with it yet, but I'll take a look into that and report back in my written review. Now one further thing I did want to cover about the light is that with the light off, let's just say you had it in low mode, and you want to instantly access high mode, you simply do that by depressing the rear switch twice. So first time it'll momentarily activate the low mode and the second press it'll enter a high mode immediately. And in this case, if this is actually not memorized, it'll still default back to low once you shut off the light. So as you can see. Now another thing is you can also access strobe immediately with the light off by do pressing the switch three times instead of the two. So one, two, three. And likewise, with the high activation, this particular strobe activated in such a way is not memorized. So it'll default back to low the next time you turn back on the light. So like I said, it, it seems a little confusing at first, but once you have it nailed down, this is a fantastic UI. You could, it's really, um, like I said, from the perspective of tactical use, I guess it is um, very good because you can lock out you know, the lower modes if you don't need it. You have instant access to high or strobe, uh, which re actually reminds me a little bit of the Phoenix LD10, but that required two hands and you had to you know, unscrew the head to enter one set of modes, which was just high and strobe, or uh, you, which was tightening the head, I believe, if I remember correctly, and then loosening a head, it goes into you know, the other modes as well as the blinky. So in this case, like I said, um, if you need instant on high tactical use, it's there. And same thing, if you need instant on strobe, it's there. Now, I'm not a law enforcement or a military um, man, so I can't really say, based upon personal use from a tactical perspective, that that's great. But I'm just, you know, using an educated guess as to, like, just say, if I was in a situation where I felt threatened and I needed immediate access to high, um, this gives me that easy access to it. And likewise with the strobe. Beam profile wise, the Olight M18 actually has um, some decent throw because even though it does have a um, smaller reflector, it's actually fairly deep for its size. So currently this is on maximum output. Um, and there's actually a pretty nice tight hotspot, although that's probably not being captured correctly on the uh, camera. But overall tent wise, this is pretty close. So I currently have this locked on uh, daylight, although on the screen it's a little bit more purple than what I'm seeing in real life. In real life this is not that blue, this is a little bit more bordering towards um, a greenish white and the outer fringe here, the spill is really more of a I would say more of a, a magenta purple than this uh, dark purple that you're seeing on the screen here. So it does have three well spaced outputs of 500 lumens and this is actually five lumens. I'm gonna move this around so you can actually see it. Now this 5 lumens works very nicely at night, perhaps a little bit bright for dark adapted eyes, but overall for general use it's quite nice actually. Great for you know uh, navigating hallways, uh, checking on the kids. Uh, that's medium of 100 lumens, you're likely uh, picking up some flickering on the screen there, although uh, I'm sensitive to PWM but I don't notice that uh, in actual use so, and again back to high. Now of course it does, uh, as I had previously mentioned, that red or pink O-ring uh, ring right around the glass, um, it does cast it to a certain degree. So as you see here, you're probably seeing a little bit of it right there. But as soon as I move away, it does disappear. So overall, it shouldn't affect the, the beam profile too much. Now, again, unfortunately, this... Um, so unfortunately, the camera's not really quite 
capturing the beam profile correctly because this uh, hotspot is actually a lot tighter than what I'm seeing here, right? So the actual central hotspot is where my fingertip is. Then there's a slight transition to the outer corona here. Then finally a nice transition out here to the spill. Now by way of comparison, oh and as you can see, you know, thanks to the credit light bezel, it allows you to easily see if the light is on. I do have um, a Jetbeam TCR1. It's similar in the sense that it uses an XML U2 and it does have a smooth reflector, although much shallower, so it does, does have a flutter beam profile. Output wise, it's roughly about the same, so I'm going to go ahead and get this started and put it a little bit side by side so you can see the beam profile co comparison. So you can see it's a much floodier profile than, say, that of the um, Olight M18. So again, the Olight M18, sorry. So as you can see, the M18 does have a pretty uh, tight beam overall. Beam angle wise, as I had alluded to earlier, it actually has a fairly tight hotspot. So as you can see right now, the dead center, I, I would say it's actually about, I'd give it about 10 to 15 degrees, right? But um, that's a really bright white center hotspot. Then it transitions out to a little bit greenish, uh, uh, corona, if you will, and that is probably about, I would say, roughly 40 degrees. And then finally, the overall profile, which, and let me ease up, uh, I do have the shutter locked into uh, 1 1,000th one of a second before, so I'm going to ease that up a bit, drop it down to 1 400th, of, or actually 1 320th, so you can see the overall beam profile. And what I would say that that is roughly about 70 degrees. And here, as you can see, this is pretty obvious, the pink being cast from the O-ring. But again, in normal use, you really shouldn't see that once you have this beam cast out to a distance. It's only when you have it right up against an object that you'll notice that tent. As an initial conclusion, this is a really nifty compact light that um, has a lot going for it. So first of all, the ability to run on two CR123s or a single 18650 uh, gives it some flexibility in terms of what it can power up on. And then likewise, the UI has uh, three fixed modes with well-spaced output uh, that is activated via the side switch and has a hit and stroke um, when you don't need it but instant access via three quick presses of the switch when you do. So as previously mentioned, um, you could also instantly access high via two clicks of the switch. So from a tactical use perspective, which is what this was designed for, it seems like it has that covered. But again, I'm not speaking from a law enforcement or military use perspective, so I'll let others weigh in here. And contrary to what the name Maverick may imply, once you nail down the use of the UI, uh, it will obey your every beck and whim. So again, I would suggest that you uh, take the time to really familiarize yourself with the UI. But fit and finish wise, again, it's just typical Olight quality. I do not notice um, any serious flaws with this lights whatsoever. Um, in fact, no flaws whatsoever. I would really have to struggle to nitpick on something, but to be honest, I, I really cannot find anything whatsoever to nitpick on. And that concludes this review. As part of FTC disclosures, the Olight M18 Maverick was provided by BatteryJunction.com for review. Thanks again for watching.